fix that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that and, and the other one is on there. And they'll all be on the screen. <laughs> From hither and yon, hither and yon. Yeah. Ohio, yeah. Pennsylvania, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 But why don't you come up and so that one gets by? Oh no, that's okay.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Seaview as we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus to worship. This is, um, this is a good Sunday because uh, new things are happening, and um, we're really glad to be able to introduce uh, a pastor and family who might possibly become uh, the next first family, so to speak, uh, of Seaview Baptist Church, although I don't, I don't think I like the sound of that either. Um, there's one who is first, not us, and, and he ain't us. Oh. Uh, at this time, I'm wondering if, uh, if you would, Mark, if you would bring your family, uh, lead your family up to the platform so that everybody can get a chance to see them. Come on up. I said, when I was talking with them, I said one of the scariest things that anybody does is public speaking. Um, people would rather uh, die than do public speaking. <laughs> but uh, so we're not going to ask you to do public speaking. We may ask you to die. <laughs> your, your, your dad might be doing that before he's all done this morning. <laughs> but we were oh, just a warm welcome, Jackson. Um, now, you are, where are you in your education at this point? I'm going to be a freshman next year, so I'm going into freshman. Uh, if all this works out, you'll be a freshman at Mainland? Yes. Okay, excellent. Any things that you really like to do? Um, I'm into, like, track and sports, art, stuff like that. Phillies fan? Oh. <laughs> Not big on following. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We'll help you. <laughs> Emma, now Emma, you are in, where are you in your education experience? I'm a junior in high school next year. Okay, so you'll be a junior at Mainland, probably, yeah? And, yeah, and, uh, and you haven't actually been, you've been doing school in a different kind of a way, haven't you? Yeah, I've been doing school online for the past two years, and I started doing it because of COVID, because I didn't want to be going into school and having to quarantine and all that, so. Okay, so this will really be a new experience for you. Okay, anything that you want us to know about you, things that you really like to do? <laughs> um. <laughs> this is the public speaking part. This is terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I enjoy playing the piano, and I like to read. So you're a reader. Okay. <laughs> Susan, so y we are so glad to have you here, <coughs> and uh, let me ask you, how long have you been married to Mark? Ooh, we're coming up on 23 years. 23 years. Married bliss, right? All the time. All the time. <laughs> it must be perfect. <laughs> we were talking about what's perfect and what's not perfect. <laughs> no such thing as a perfect relationship, but good ones. Um, Susan, what are the things that kind of juice you? Um, we love to walk. We walk every morning. That's kind of our time together. Um, I also love to read. Um, just, yeah, being with people. Yeah. You like to walk? I do, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are wondering, I, I broke my fibula walking uh, a week and a half ago and just found out a few days ago it's broken. <laughs> but that's okay. And Mark, Pastor Mark. Yes, Mark is fine. Mark is fine. Yes. We want to welcome you, and would you just give us just a few words about yourself? Sure. So uh, take that for me? Sure. Um, I've been in ministry almost half my life, and that's hard to, hard to believe, but um, God has taken our entire family on some amazing journeys together. Um, we can literally say that we have been from coast to coast now. Um, so we've done uh, ministry in Mexico, we've done ministry in Ohio, we've done ministry now in New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, uh, myself in Honduras and Nicaragua and other places as well. And uh, we just continue to follow God's lead um, on all the decisions that we make. Um, and just very happy to say that this is kind of a corporate decision uh, with the Larimer family to be here this morning. And uh, we're excited to, uh, to be a part of your church family and are excited for what God has in store for all of us. Thanks so much. Uh, Phillies fan? <sighs> Pirates. 
Is that, you're going to say, is that major league? <laughs> oh. Well, really, a, a warm welcome to each of you. You did well. You did public speaking, <laughs> and you didn't die. So that's great. Thanks for coming and joining us for a few moments and uh, indulging us with just a, a few questions. Thank you. We do have some, some things coming up uh, besides the meeting that will be uh, after the service this morning. Uh, <clears throat> on the 23rd of this month, uh, we're going to have Bruce and Ann Borquist with us. That, that will be a, a potluck meal, a, a dinner at 6 o'clock. That's a Thursday, uh, the 23rd of June. Uh, the Borquist have been serving in New Zealand with International Ministries, and uh, th it's the first time they've gotten a chance since the pandemic to get home. And so they're going to be sharing with us, and we re uh, really are looking forward to the, their being with us and hope that you'll bring a dish and share the evening together with us. At this time, I'm going to transition away from all this talk and invite you to be quiet, to seek God's face. We didn't come simply to hear a preacher. We came to worship, to draw close to the one who loves us and will never stop. Let's worship the Lord together. This is also Trinity Sunday, a, a day when we recognize that our God is three in one. And that's, that's the same God that we serve 365 days a year. 
And we oftentimes don't think of God. We think, well, I'm going to pray to Jesus. You know, they're always together. And we need to be able to embrace that the way they invite us to their table. So I'd invite you, if you're able, to stand with me to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Remain standing and join your voices with mine as we pray together. Triune God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things and all that is to come, we follow Christ who you sent. It is because of him that we get a clearer vision of you. You heal people and transform lives and call us to join in your ministry. Jesus was crucified, died, and was raised again. Through him, you bid us to die and rise with him in the service of the healing of the world. We are moved by your Holy Spirit, together with the communion of saints, as members of the body of Christ. We are confident of your presence as you stay by our side. In our worship, it is our desire to follow Christ and by the grace of the Holy Spirit to give ourselves wholly to you. Amen. And so we sing together about the amazing grace of God. This is amazing grace.
Our next song is by Faith. And I'm going to put you on the spot tomorrow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're always on the spot. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yep. What role has faith played oh, goodness. in your life? Now, I know that's a big question. That's a huge question. Yes. Faith for me has always been initiated by God. It's mm -hmm. him moving and me responding. And so that idea of, of by faith is first God making a move and then me coming to that crisis of belief of whether I'll follow him to where he's going or if I'll stay where I am. And so living by faith is sensing God's movement and following him obediently wherever it is that he leads you, whether that be to Ohio, Mexico, New Jersey, and parts unknown, when God leads and when God nudges, will we follow him? So, with that background then, that gives us a little bit more in back of this song. By faith. By faith.
Absolutely. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the glorious hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. We thank you that you can continue to call us to faith. And you continually move in our lives, in our country, in our marriages, in our families. And Father God, we ask that you would call us together with a spirit of unity this morning. As we continue to worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give you the honor and the glory in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now in the way that's comfortable for you, greet one another. Amen. Pastor Ned is moved to, to do our Old Testament reading and then be followed by Pastor Mark. Do the gospel reading and then we'll lead right into your message. I love all the smiling faces this morning. I love the vibe going on in here. You sounded like a great choir singing this morning. And we welcome all the visitors and everyone who's friends today. And we pray God's blessing upon the word. We're, we're so privileged to have the word, God's word and power and love for us a message for all of us. So hear the word from the Old Testament from 1 Kings 19. And you can pronounce these words any way you like, but I'll try my best. <laughs> then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel king over Aram, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, and shall anoint king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Maholah, who shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu, shall be put to death. And the one who escaped from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. This is the word of the Lord. It's a reading from the book of John, chapter 16. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, 
He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, and he will make, will take of mine, and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine, and I will disclose it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. I was really careful because for 16 years I've been saying good morning Crossway, so I just figured I would eliminate that altogether and just say church to you this morning. It is good um, to be with you this morning. And for those of you who I haven't met yet, I am Pastor Mark, but please feel free to call me Mark. Um, and uh, it is just a joy to be in the house of the Lord this, uh, this morning with you and to have this time to share the gospel with you and also to just share a little bit about what God has put on my heart this morning. Um, any people watchers in here this morning? Come on, let's be honest. People watchers, when I go to a baseball game or something like that, I'll be honest, I watch more people than I watch of the baseball game. And I love sitting on an aisle seat or somewhere and just watching people go by and kind of wondering what's going on with their lives and things like that. Well, over the past uh, week, we've been on vacation. This is the strangest vacation I've ever been on in my life. Um, but it is, it's been a good one. But spending time down at the beach, uh, it is an awesome place to people watch. And one of the things that I've noticed is there are two ways to get into the water. There are two ways, especially this time of year where it hasn't really warmed up yet, but there are two ways to get in, and you're probably familiar with both of them. And let me just say from the onsite that neither one of the approaches are wrong. Neither one of the approaches are wrong. It's just your personal preference. And so you know the one when you walk into the ocean and you're doing it very slowly and very methodically and every time a wave comes, you give it one of those and your shoulders go up and your arms go back. And it's one of those moments where I always questioned it because when it's raining outside, how many of you will crunch up your shoulders like that? Can you stop the rain when you crunch up your shoulders like that? You can't, but it's just something that's natural. And people were doing this over and over. I would watch them, and they would go in, and as the waves would come up, they'd go like that. But then there's the other people that just throw themselves into the water. And you know them. They just are full bore. They get up from their blanket, and they go tearing down the beach and just run as far as they can until a wave knocks at their ankles, and they go flying into the ocean. Right? Usually, it's a guy. And most of the time, there's a group of guys that are prodding him to do it, or there's a group of girls that, are incur or that he's trying to impress to do this. But as I said, the, neither approach is wrong, because the goal is to get into the water. The goal is to move into the waves. The goal is to swim. And I want to bring that into the spiritual realm a little bit for us this morning, because as we consider following God, the one thing that you don't want to do as you are going into the deep with him is not get into the water. It doesn't matter if you approach slowly, as the word of God says, that, that his word will illuminate our feet. And so that says to me that he's going to provide light for the next step that is ahead. Or if you're the kind of person that is just going to run full bore and dive into what God has for you. Both ways are adequate. Both ways are awesome. As long as we continue to move toward what God is doing. But here's where I kind of want to land this morning. We were going to talk a lot about Elijah and Elisha. But I think about this morning as, I, as God has put it upon my heart. When we start to talk about the gospel, we start with John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. That whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen, church? Amen. But can I say something that may catch you off guard a little? Belief is not enough. Belief is not enough. You see, because Satan and the demons believe in Jesus. But they're missing something. They're missing that step of obedience. They're missing that all-in kind of a mentality. And this morning, I want to talk to us what surrender looks like, what obedience looks like, what it means to live in total surrender to our God each and every day. And for some folks, it's a slow waiting out into what God has in store for us. For others, it's run and dive in and see what God has in store. But where we don't want to be is left standing on the beach and missing our opportunity to follow after by faith in what God has in store for us. And you think about what surrender is. Surrender is not about something that's in the future. 
It's about surrendering right now to what's in front of you. I've heard people say all the time, I'm going to surrender one day, right? When I get done with school, then I'm going to, I'm going to commit to a church and I'm going to, I'm going to follow God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or when my kids are grown, then I'll have more time to serve and maybe I can go on that mission trip. Or when I'm retired, I'll have plenty of time to do things like that. But what is it that God is asking you to surrender to now? Right now. Maybe where you work. Maybe where you go to school. Maybe you're retired and you have extra time, but God is asking you to give of yourself in some way, in some shape, because we all have gifts and talents and abilities and passions that God wants to use for his plan and for his purpose. And so this morning, I want us to recognize that life is too short to stay on the beach. It's too short. God is calling us out into the deep, and we need to be people that are ready to surrender. So would you pray a quick prayer with me? And then I'm going to get into the Word of God. You thought I was like halfway through, right? <laughs> pray with me. Heavenly Father, here is my life. Change me through the power of your Word. Speak to me. I'm listening. Amen. So the backstory to this story of Elijah is amazing. Because here is this prophet, this man of God, and he has just stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with prophets of a false god and asked his god to show up in a mighty way. And he did. God showed up, and Elisha, slain by the sword, 40 false prophets. And he's the only prophet of God left. But this doesn't ring well with a woman named Jezebel. Are you familiar with her? And she basically puts out a warrant for the life of Elijah. She says, she swears that this day, she doesn't care how God deals with her. But this day, she will have by sword the life of Elijah. And Elijah goes on the run. He's afraid. How many of you would be afraid? I'd be afraid if somebody put out a hit for me. She puts out a hit for him, and he runs, and he runs for the hills. And as he runs for the hills, he encounters God. If you know the story, God doesn't show up in the earthquake. He doesn't show up in the wave, or in the, in, in the wind. He doesn't show up in a fire. He shows up to Elijah in a still, small voice. And he prepares him for what's next. He gives him the instruction to go and anoint two new kings and anoint another man, Elisha, who will be his successor in ministry. So Elisha went from there, and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elisha went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and he went back. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. The story's amazing. It's so compelling that this man who just meets this prophet Elijah, the moment that his mantle is thrown around him, and we're wondering, what, what is this mantle? It, it is basically Elijah is saying to Elijah, you are next in line. You are the next prophet. You are the next voice of God. You are the next healer, the next teacher. And without saying a word, Elisha gives in to the new plan and the purpose that is put upon his life. He doesn't wait. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't go into the deep and, and crunch up his shoulders either. He's one of those guys that just runs and dives in deep to what God has in store for him, for him. It's interesting, in the New Testament, Jesus makes this shocking statement. And to me, it's both challenging and it's convicting. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone. Would you repeat anyone for me this morning? Let's try that again. I tell you the truth, anyone. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And he will do even greater things. Underline that. He will do even greater things. This is Jesus talking. And he's saying, if you follow me, 
I tell you the truth, and you have faith that you will do even greater things than these. Greater things than healing the blind? Greater things than raising a man from the dead? This is Jesus telling us if, if we go all in for him, that he will do greater things than we have even seen the Son of God doing. Does that convict your spirit? Because when I look at my life, I, I, I think, oh, I've never healed anyone. I remember years ago, Emma brought me a frog that had been long dead in our driveway. Long dead. Like skinny long dead. Right? Flat long dead. And she asked me to pray over the frog. It didn't go well. <laughs> I didn't have the power to bring that frog back to life. And when I read what Jesus is saying, he says, if you follow me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will do even greater things than these. Because the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if we believe in him and we surrender to a living God, he lives and resides in us. That fires me up. That means that I have Holy Spirit power living inside of me that is waiting to come out if I'll be obedient and I'll trust God with everything that I have. It challenges me. It convicts me. And in, these passage, in this passage, there's three invitations that are given, and I want to share those with you really quickly this morning. The first one is this, that God gives us this invitation to a higher calling. He gives us this invitation to a higher calling. So Elijah takes off his mantle, and he basically is, 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 is passing on this, this new calling to Elisha's life. What had Elisha been doing? He had a really awful view of behind a team of oxen for many, many years. But there was a rhythm and there was a pattern to that plowing that he was doing. How many of us get stuck in the rhythm and the plowing? We know that we were created for more. We know that we were created for better. But for whatever reason, we get complacent and we get used to that job that's in front of us. I believe as I look at the words of God that he tells us and he, he's calling us all to something that is greater. And I'm not saying that God is calling you to be a full-time uh, full missionary or become a pastor. He may be. But what if God is calling you to be greater at work? What if God is calling you to be greater in your marriage? To a deeper sense of love, to a deeper sense of longing, to being a person that is willing to be an agent of change in our communities. It's a higher calling. And he's inviting all of us to this higher calling. And the awesome thing about this is when Elijah finds Elisha, Elisha is completely unaware that God and Elijah had been conspiring about him. Completely unaware. He's going about his daily business. It's probably his parents' business. And he's tilling a field. And all of a sudden, everything changes. And what he had been doing, the ordinary and the mundane, now become a greater calling upon his life. And immediately, he is ready and up for the task. His job was stable. How many of us have stable jobs? They pay the bills, so we stay there. Right? How many of us, we had that goal of, of, of owning a home and raising a family, and we could kind of postpone the greater things that God has. It's hard to think that there's something greater than kids. It's harder to think that there's something greater than a, a, a solid retirement in 401k. But God has something greater for each and every one of us. If we'll lean into him and wade into the deep, will we trust him with that higher calling? He has a greater plan. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples when he called them? I'll make you fishers of men. They had no idea what that even meant. But they dropped their nets and they said, I want to go where you go. Because I know it's better than where I am right now. How easy would it have been for the disciples to say, but Jesus, this is a stable place for me to be. I've got a family that's depending upon me. I've got a, an income that I can depend upon. I've got friends in my neighborhood and they know me and I know them. I can't go with you right now. But the disciples said yes. And they waded into the deep. Here comes the rain of God right now, right? This is amazing. And then Jesus gives us this great commission. He's calling us all to something greater. 
And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you've gone to seminary. It doesn't matter if you've gone on a mission trip. It doesn't matter if you've worked at the at local soup kitchen or what it is. God is calling you with this great commission to go into all the world and to teach and to preach and to baptize. Does Jesus say, I want the pastors to do this? Does he say, I want the paid professionals to do this? This is your great commission. My great commission to go into all the world, to teach, to preach, and to baptize, to show the world the love of Jesus Christ. Will we wade into the deep and go where God is calling us to go? God's calling all of us believers to not just survive, to do the life of, mon uh, of the mundane and the mediocre, to be comfortable and to be complacent, to live a life behind a plow, He's calling us all to something so much greater. Continuing in 1 Kings 19, it says, So Elijah went from there, and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing in a field with 12 oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak, his mantle around him, representing his calling as a prophet, and proclaiming this new calling upon his life. Don't be afraid of God's calling on your life. It's far greater. He will do great things with it if we'll trust him with it. He's calling us all to a greater and higher calling. The second invitation is this, is to a deeper surrender. How many of us want to have a deeper surrender to God? Amen. It's about going deeper with him. It's not just about knowing him and loving him. It's not just about believing him. It's about having a deep surrender to our God. Where does Elijah, Elisha start? He starts with obedience. That's where it begins. It starts with leaning into God and seeing what he has in store for us. Elisha didn't walk. He didn't walk up to, the, to, to Elijah and, and test the waters. He left his oxen and he ran to be with Elijah. He doesn't just pray a prayer. He makes a move into a deeper surrender. And he makes sure that he has absolutely nothing to go back to. I love that about Elisha. You talk about burning your ships. He wanted to make sure that he didn't have the safety and security of home to go back to. Because all of his steps from this moment on were going to be forward. Salvation is about kissing your old life goodbye. And embracing the new life that Christ has for you. And maybe he's calling some of us to it or back to it today. It's not just about believing. It's about a life and living a life of radical obedience to him. 1 Kings 19, 21 says, So Elisha left and went back. He's been given permission to go and talk to his parents and kiss them goodbye. And Elisha, Elijah says, Go. Go tell them goodbye. And he runs, and he tells his parents goodbye, and he takes the yoke of oxen and he slaughters them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he set out to be with Elijah, to follow him, to become his attendant. This isn't a story about stewardship of farming equipment, because it doesn't make any sense, does it? But to Elisha, he was making a bold turn in his life. He was making sure that there was nothing to go back to. He wanted to live a life of total surrender and go deeper with his God. The third thing he does is this, we receive is an invitation to a greater life. And here's where I want to land this morning because Elisha led a greater life. It's amazing when you think about the things that Elijah did. Elisha did twice as many miracles that Elijah ever did. When Elijah was called home, Elisha prays this incredible prayer, and he asked for a double portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. Has anybody ever prayed that prayer? What would that do to the church if we prayed for a double portion of the spirit in our lives? And as I looked over a list of the miracles that were done by Elisha, see if any of these sound familiar to you. He raised a boy from the dead. He multi multiplied a loaf of bread. He healed a leper. He healed the blind. 
He healed the water supply of Jericho. And he did so much more with that double portion that had been given to him. There was a greater life that was ahead of Elisha, and it began with a life of total surrender, of absolute abandonment. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. We never get to greater, I feel, because we never are willing to leave our life behind and not surrender. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways and take up your cross and follow me. You see, Jesus recognized it was more than belief. Jesus is asking us for our obedience. He's asking for all of us, our whole self, everything that we are, everything that we have, every gift, talent, ability, every passion that we have, and to invest it into the kingdom of God. Quite literally, we need to set fire to whatever it is that is tethering our lives to what is comfortable, what is mundane, and what is complacent. I think about how God has moved in our lives. I'm talking about the Larimer family here. And I'm so blessed to have a wife that will not only follow my lead, but will follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit upon our family. We started out doing ministry together um, at First Baptist Church at, at our home camp, and we did that for several years as friends before we became anything else. And through that, God was starting to knit us together. He was starting to work on our hearts, and he was starting to prepare us for a life together. God would open up doors for us to serve in ministry together at First Baptist Church where I became a staff member, and God continued to move and continued to grow us. And called us eventually to go and to serve um, in, in La Paz, Mexico. And it was such an incredible time of ministry. I was uh, talking to a group last night and I said, I said, what was fun about that story is that we found out that Susan was pregnant with Emma about three weeks before we decided to go to Mexico. And so many people said, are you still going to go? And it wasn't a matter about testing the waters. We had already responded to God's call and we said, yes, why would we go back? And make another turn. God called us out of Mexico and sent us to Ohio. It doesn't make sense in our economy. I tell our church all the time, not only did I not know about Ohio, I didn't care about Ohio. <laughs> I certainly didn't care about a little church that was planted in an elementary school in Harrison, Ohio. But God knew them. And he knew that they needed a teacher, they needed a leader, they needed a pastor, they needed a shepherd. And they needed a family that was going to help to lead them into what was greater for them. 16 years later, God moves our hearts to respond to an invitation to come to Seaview Baptist Church here in Linwood, Ohio. Did I know about you? Or Linwood, Ohio. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Good morning, Crossway. I didn't know about you. God did. But we decided to go all in. As we sit here right now, our realtor is waiting for a call from us. Should we sell? <laughs> I, I wasn't thinking there was going to be that quick a response. I love it, though. We're ready to burn our plows. We're ready to slaughter the oxen and move into what God has for us. Is it scary? You better believe it. But we've walked with God for this long, and he has never failed us. In fact, what he has done is he has showed us his greatness. He has showed us his compassion. He has showed us his love. He has showed us time and time again how we can just wait upon him. And I don't know why he shows up at 1159, 59, but he does. But he always shows up. But it began with surrender. It began with surrender. When I was back in school, I shared this with another group that we met with. 
Am I going too long? I tend to go long. You should know that up front. <laughs> Good. I like it. I wanted to be a marine biologist from the time I was in fifth grade. Mrs. Knaip was an incredible teacher, and we were doing a segment on oceanography, and I fell in love with it. And everything about the ocean, everything about the depths, the unknown that was under the sea that most people are afraid of, I couldn't get enough of it. And so I just bide my time. I was going to learn as much as I could, and I was going to go to school, and I was going to go to college, and I was going to become a marine biologist. I didn't care what it took. And so in Kutztown University, a landlocked university, that's where I was, I was a marine science major, and I was preparing for my senior year. And the year between your junior and your senior year, you went and you did a work study uh, down on Wallops Island. There was a, a marine biology research center um, in Virginia off the coast. And I was ready. I had bags packed, and I was so excited to see what God had in store for me. I was single, so there was nothing to keep me from that dream. And I remember I was just, I was so amped up. And I had this professor, a great Irish Catholic, Patrick Duddy. It doesn't get any more Catholic than that and Protestant and whatever. He was redhead, and he was awesome. And he used to take attendance. It was a class. It was an environmental biology class. And he used to take attendance by asking a question every, every class. There was a class of about 300 students. And he couldn't get to know us each individually. So he would usually ask a science question or an ethics question or something like that. And he would say, just write it on a piece of paper when you're done. Put it on my desk and you're excused to leave. And that's how he got to know us. A couple weeks before I was ready to leave for Wallops Island, I got a message in my inbox from Professor Duddy. And he asked me to meet him in his office. And that's never a good thing. When, when a professor calls you out and wants to see you in his office, and I went to visit with him, and our conversation went very paraphrased like this. Mark, I think you would be an incredible scientist and marine biologist, but I think you'd be a better pastor. A secular university, a man who knew nothing about me other than what I wrote on little slips of paper for an entire semester, and it was a call into the deep. God had already been doing things in my heart, but now I came to the crisis of belief. Do I go the route of the marine biologist? Or do I become something even greater? What God had designed me for, what he had wired me for, what he had placed me to be. It's a practical question too, isn't it? I had so much money invested. I was paying for my own education. Mom and dad weren't doing it. And so I had three years of college bills. And I'd be starting over again. The best decision I ever made. Second best. Susan was the first. No, I guess third. Jesus was the first. Then Susan. <laughs> I would have missed out on so much greatness to baptize people, to officiate weddings, to be a part of amazing funeral services for saints, to meet incredible people. Some of them are here today. It never would have happened if I didn't surrender. What are you tethered to that is keeping you from greater? I don't care if you're two or 122. I'll talk louder. What are you tethered to? What needs to go so that you can fully surrender, fully serve, fully give yourself to our God who is more than worthy? Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the words that you place upon my heart, I pray that they would ring true in the lives of those who have come this morning to worship you and to give you thanksgiving and praise. Here I am. Take all of me. God, if I'm tethered to anything that is keeping me of living a life that is greater, for your glory, not for mine, reveal it to me. 
and give me the courage to wade out into the deep, the deep water where you are, and help me to serve and live for you. Father God, I give you my life. Take all of me. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As a song of reflection, I want to invite you to stand with me as we sing together hymn number 366, I Surrender All. Mark and I are going to share this section of the service together as we uh, come to prayer. You, you may be seated. <laughs> as we share this time together in prayer, we know that there are things that are on your hearts, and we want to hear what's on your heart. Maybe there's something really wonderful that's happened to you. You'd like to give, bear witness to that, and we can uh, praise God with you. Maybe there's something that say, oh, my heart is heavy, hmm. and I want to I pray about this. We, We'll be glad to join you in that. So, Linda. Okay. Linda asks that we pray for her and her job and also for her sister, Dawn. Okay, thanks. Yes, Karen. Amen. 
Okay, so Karen, Karen did go through a pretty, pretty big surgery a few weeks ago, but here you are, and we praise God with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Another country heard from. <laughs> Anyone else have something? Yes, Marguerite. Okay, we remember Karen Tester, who is uh, my administrative assistant, usually hangs out in there, um, and uh, she, she's been having some stomach problems. And of course, we continue to pray for Bill and Judy Broderick as Bill goes uh, through the radiation treatment for esophageal cancer. And yes, Larder. Okay, yeah, big day this last Thursday as um, Larder and Woodland said good, goodbye to a dream mm -hmm. and to, to dream something new. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've been with you right straight along and uh, we, we join you for, for praying for the, this new thing that God is doing in you. Yeah, Kathy. Again, so we remember Hazel. Uh, Hazel DeSashi will be going, for, going in for knee surgery on Tuesday, re knee replacement. And so uh, she's that, the reason she's not with us physically is because she has to quarantine. Mm. But uh, otherwise, she would be probably right about there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, oh upstairs. Uh, uh. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of graduations going on in Terry's family. Okay, it's Mikey. Praying for your friend Adam. Okay. Can I get offer one too? Sure. Um, I just ask for prayer for um, for Crossway Community Church in Harrison, Ohio. Um, obviously, they have some. Uh, big uh, decisions to make in moving forward, um, and uh, just so thankful for the ministry that we've been able to have with them for the past 16 years, and also our friends Terry and Nelson, who will be leaving to go and minister in Poland and Ukraine mm. on Wednesday, so just asking for prayer for them. Okay, Terry and Nelson. And Nelson. Yep. Mm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ukraine continues to be on all of our hearts as uh, they just are being bombed to smithereens, mm -hmm. and yet their spirit is still strong. Amen. And you can see the presence of God's spirit in their midst. Terry and Nelson as they go. Anyone else? Yes, Lita. Leah gives us thanks for the prayers for Joshua and asks us to continue as he deals with metastatic cancer. Mm. Anyone else? All right. Just uh, be aware that the flowers in the chancel this morning are in honor of Joan Hoffmeister. Mm. Uh, Joan, you have, uh, you th this is two weeks in a row you're here. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Joan has served quietly behind the scenes as an intercessor um, the entire time that, uh, and before I got here, 
but uh, she's been my, my go-to person when I want prayer, um, especially as I'm counseling people. Joan is the one who says, I'll do it. And God has been blessed you mightily and us through you. So we give thanks for you. So with that, then, if, if there, are, there are no other prayers uh, to be lifted up, uh, we're just going to tag team there on this go. prayer. So um, why don't you lead Start us, us off? off? Sure. Let's bow our heads. Father, I just thank you and give you honor, glory, and praise for the worship that has already taken place here this morning. Father, you are so good to us. Hmm. And we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your protection, and we thank you for the way that you answer prayers. Father, there's so much in terms of transi transition happening here um, and happening in Ohio, and we ask that your hand continue uh, to be on the congregations of Seaview and Crossway. Father God, as we seek uh, your face in the midst of transition, we know that you are calling us to greater things, mm -hmm. and so we anticipate the way that you are going to move and the way that you are going to stretch us and grow us. I pray that you would continue to give us the ability to follow you exactly where it is that you want us to go. Father, this morning we give you thanks and we give you praise for all the work that has been done uh, by the search committee here at Seaview. Uh, I thank you personally just for their smiles and for their friendship, the way that uh, this congregation has opened up their hearts to my family and just especially this past week as we've been able to meet uh, new friends here at Seaview, get to get to know them and them to get to know us. We ask that you would continue to knit our hearts together in a spirit of unity and a spirit of love as we continue to grow in our desire to serve you deeply. And so, Father God, we give you thanks for that. I lift up my friends Terry and Nelson to you this morning. Father, I pray uh, just a hedge of protection around both of these men uh, as they go into potentially dangerous areas that you would watch over them mm -hmm. and that you would surround them with men and women as they do your work um, in Poland and in Ukraine. Father, that you would bless the work of their efforts and that you would get materials and that you would get food and get aid into the hands of those who desperately need it. Father, there is so much to toil and turmoil in this world. Uh, there's so much unrest. Uh, there is so much greed and there's so much desire to put others, um, put ourselves ahead of others. And I pray that you would break us um, of, the, of this incredibly uh, wicked spirit and allow us, Father, to see one another as brothers and sisters and come to a place where we can love one another and demonstrate the love of Christ to one another in a way that is accepted and in a way that is, is, is given in the truth and the spirit of love. And so, Father God, we give you all honor and glory this morning for the praises, for the prayers, for those that are here this morning with us in the spite of illnesses that they've been dealing with. And we ask that you would continue to heal and draw us closer into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that you are constantly holding new things in front of us, not telling us to forget the old things, but to kind of put a cap on them and, uh, and to move forward. We thank you, Lord, that in this last week, uh, Larder and Woodland were able to put a cap on something that they've been doing the last five years and now are beginning to move into new territory. So there's transition there, Lord, and we thank you that they've been able to see your hand in the transition. We thank you, Lord, that when our jobs <laughs> sometimes uh, just give us all kinds of struggle, um, we can call out to you, as Linda has, and she's asked us to pray for her and her job. This is not the first time, Lord. Um, so we continue to come alongside of her to ask, Lord, that you would fill her with your spirit, knowing that what she's doing at the hospital is just as important as what's happening right here on a platform. Because when you call us to something, you call us to the thing that we're supposed to be involved in. So thank you. And Lord, we also want to continue to pray for Linda's sister, Dawn, uh, Lord, you know the need there, and we know that you will fulfill it. Lord, there were so many names that were mentioned, and we could just go down a list, but you know each of these names. You know Bill and Judy Broderick. You know what they're struggling with. And so we're glad, Lord, that they're not just left off and out and astray, Lord, you gather them in close to your heart as they go through this really hard time. We thank you, Lord, for Joshua, who, although he's experienced a horrendous problem as, as such a, a young boy, still, Lord, he is not forsaken. You have been with him, and we join you in that. 
Lord, again, we are grateful. And so I ask, Lord, that you would help us now as a congregation to lift our voices and the names of people that we're grateful for, or the names of people that are on our hearts, that we're, we just lift it all before you right now. Gary Wilson and Alan. Each name known to you, Lord, precious in your sight. And we ask, Lord, that each one would know that they are not forgotten. You see them and you bear them up. Restore them, Lord, with hope. We thank you today for Joan Hoffmeister and for the ministry that she's had over these many years. We thank you, Lord, she's not done. You're not done using her. And we're just glad to have her in our midst. And so we thank you for her. We also want to pray for uh, Brian and Lynette Smith as they serve down in La Romana and uh, the DR. We thank you, Lord, that they have a heart for Haitian people, as we do. And so we join our hearts together and ask, Lord, that they would feel your support, your supply for everything that they put their hand to. Lord, there are still lots of things on our minds. We have a meeting later, and we ask, Lord, that as we prepare for that meeting, uh, that, again, we would feel the movement of your Holy Spirit in our midst. Thank you for Jesus, because it's because of him that we know who you are. We get a clearer picture. Lord, May that vision of who Jesus is become clearer and clearer in each of our minds and hearts. That we would know that we can trust you. And even when the words fail us, we know that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Pastor Mark, I hope you don't mind if I steal a little bit of your message, reuse it. It's so true that we should be giving ourselves to giving. And it's not because the church needs the money. God will never, God loves this church, we know that. He will never let it fail due to lack of finances. But our relationship to giving and our depth of being in God are interrelated. I'm not, and I've shared this with the church before, I'm not sure if our faith grows and we give more, or we give more and that causes our faith to grow. But what difference does it make? It still happens. Segue. It's going, it's going to have to be. <laughs> All right. Pastor Mark Andrew, this family, what a wonderful gift that's coming to this church. God has revealed that to me. This is what a wonderful gift we're going to have that we can learn and grow in our own depth of faith with this instrument of God working for us. And where have we come from? <laughs> Eat this. Where have we come from? We were, we're losing a gift, but we're not. That's my point. We're getting to have our cake and eat it too. <laughs> it's true. It's true. He's still going to be with us uh, as an asset to the pastor, as an asset to us, an asset to the church. And Kathy, I mean, it's just the life you have shown us in the example. And now it's doubled because we have both of you. How does that work? How do we, how do we get so, I was going to say lucky, but no, how gifted? 
All right, and one other segue. Um, we'll get to the Austin Brace shortly. <laughs> I think. And now, and this will probably be mentioned several times. Uh, the um, meeting, the church meeting after this is not going to be on the stream. However, a lot of you on the stream, I'm sure, would like to be involved in the vote. So I'm going to read you a phone number, and I'm sure it's going to come a few more times. Uh, and if you miss it this time, you'll have other opportunities. But you're going to be texting your answer. If you're ready, write fast. 609 457 4949. And I'll repeat that once, and I'm sure it'll be repeated later on when Karen's up here. 609 457 4949. Please join me. Lord, we thank you that we are enabled to be able to give back to you the resources you at first gave us to begin with. And Lord, I pray that these gifts as they come in, they would be multiplied in order that this church can have a bigger voice for you in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to worship in this place, but we continue to worship out there. Because the worship, really, that we do, it's the work of the people. We worship when we serve. And so I encourage you to go forth, and if there's a way that we can come alongside of you in your ministry, we're prepared to pray with you. Uh, we do have prayer counselors that would be ready to meet with you. Um, this is a little unusual kind of a Sunday because uh, we're most of us are going to just stay seated here. Uh, but uh, there will be a short break uh, between the service and then our congregational meeting where people uh, that are not members and you feel like you say, I, I think I want to go, uh, we, we bless you as you go. Uh, but we want you, if you are a member and want to participate in the meeting, we ask you to continue to, to stay in here. And again, as uh, Andy mentioned that number, if you would like, because this will not, it will not be live streamed here on out. Um, so uh, if you have a comment, a question, uh, you're, you want your voice to be heard, you can text it to 609-457-4949. And now, as the people of God, 
We rely on the faithfulness of God. Morning by morning, let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness. As we go forth this morning, may the Lord make his face to shine upon us. May the Lord give us strength and humility for what lies ahead. May the Lord draw us into the deep, and may we not get tethered to the shore, but follow him where he would have us to go. May God bless you as you go this week to love and to serve and to bring honor to him. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.